let's continue looking at multiple loci and let's think about a couple of loci on a chromosome. We'll think about them like this. At this first locus, we have a lowercase a allele and a capital A allele. And the second locus will represent it with these lowercase b alleles. And let's think about a population where the frequencies of these two different a alleles are roughly equal. And we're going to think about them as being a situation in which there's the same fitness. So the capital A allele and the lowercase a allele are neutral, right? They're, they confer the same fitness. Their frequencies we would expect to be completely determined by drift, right? Just changing over time. So now let's think about what happens if there's a mutation on one of these lowercase b alleles in some individual in the population to create a new allele that is advantageous. So if that happens in a population like this, or so some individuals are like this, if that mutation happens here on that chromosome, then this advantageous allele is now in close proximity to a capital A allele. On the other hand, if it happens to occur Say, in, if we have this situation, if the mutation happens to occur here, now that advantageous allele is on the same chromosome as the lowercase a allele. And so, randomly, this capital B allele is going to be associated with either this allele or this allele, and just by random chance. And if it's advantageous, that chromosome is going to be under selection. The selection increase in the frequency of this allele is going to act to kind of increase the frequency of this chromosome as well. So whichever allele is linked to the capital B new advantageous mutation will increase in frequency as the capital B allele. So as B increases in frequency, so does A in this example here, if we're thinking about that example there. And so now let's think about, as this is increasing in frequency from an initial copy and at some later point, so for example, when the capital B allele, say, gets to a frequency of 50%, right? So it's like on its way to fixation, it's halfway there, right? It started off as a single copy, it made it through the stochasticity at the beginning, um, wasn't lost, started to increase in frequency. Before it fixes, um, it gets to a point where it's about 50%, it's kind of on its way to fixation. Now let's think about how frequent these haplotypes will be in the population if we have no recombination, right? If we have total linkage between these two loci and there's no recombination, well, capital B getting to 50%, if it was next to the capital A, that means these guys are at 50%. And that means that there aren't any of these guys, right? Because the capital B allele is only associated with capital A allele. And then remaining two haplotypes, will make up the other 50%. And now if we were to calculate the linkage disequilibrium, remember it was this times this, so that would be 0 0.5, 0 0.25, minus this times this, 0 0.25, 0. When you calculate that out, 1, 2, 5, so we can actually see how a selection process like this is one of the ways in which linkage disequilibrium can arise. Right? If you have a bunch of different alleles and maybe link disequilibrium is initially zero, selection on a haplotype, if you don't have recombination, will cause this linkage disequilibrium. So to kind of just state this, Selection causes linkage disequilibrium 
unless there is recombination, right? We saw earlier that recombination can reduce linkage disequilibrium. Arguably, this linkage disequilibrium caused by selection and potentially caused by drift, one of the other ways of restating the purpose of sex, that the purpose of sex is to remove linkage disequilibrium. If you, now that we have this way of thinking about things, if you go back to the lecture where we talked about the advantages of sex, you can see that several of those advantages of sex can be interpreted as sex is a mechanism that allows a population to reduce any linkage disequilibrium that arises. So either linkage disequilibrium that prevented advantageous alleles from combining in the same individuals, or linkage disequilibrium that prevented mutation-free individuals from being generated during reproduction. Right? So Muller's ratchet and that combination of beneficial alleles, those two advantages of sex are really just the advantages of having the capability to remove linkage disequilibrium when it exists. A second thing that we can think about is when this capital B allele fixes, then the heterozygosity at the nearby locus is gone, right? So the capital B allele, if it was associated with the capital A allele, if there's no recombination, then this thing fixing is the same thing as this fi thing fixing. And so where we used to have a locus that had multiple alleles, when this thing fixes, this thing will fix and will have lost that allele. And so that actually creates a very useful technique. If we measure heterozygosity along a chromosome, We start at one end of the chromosome, go all the way to the other end of the chromosome. All the way along, we're looking at the alleles that are present at the loci on that chromosome. There'll be some sort of baseline heterozygosity based on population size, mutation rate, whatever. But if we see a dip, if we see a dip like this, that means that there's been some sort of selection right there, right? Selection for an allele on this part of the chromosome would fix all the nearby alleles that had been variable. And if we scan along and we see something like maybe this, that's also a sign of selection. This sort of selection is either an allele that's kind of on its way to fixing, so it's bringing down the variation near it, or perhaps it's an allele that fixed a while ago and now new mutations have occurred and are restoring the genetic variation in that region. And so this actually creates a really interesting technique. We can look at chromosomes, we can measure the heterozygosity along a chromosome, and where we see these dips, we can see that selection is happening in that region, and then we can go to our genome, right? because we have all these genome projects to create genomes, and we can go and see, okay, so in this region, what are the genes that are present? In this region, what are the genes that are present? Right? If you think about just having a genome sequence all by itself, it's not actually particularly useful. And one of the ways in which having a genome sequence becomes useful is when you get data like this, and it gives you a clue for which genes are the ones that are under selection. So for example, if we did an analysis like this, and we were looking at humans, for example, wherever we saw these dips, that would be indication of genes that had recently been selected during human history and if those dips are not present in chimpanzees, our closest relatives, then we would know this is selection that has occurred within humans after we split from chimpanzees, and then those genes may well be the ones that are important in terms of distinguishing us from chimpanzees, right? These are the genes that have been selected more recently since we split from chimpanzees. Now, if we had a dip like this for both humans and chimpanzees, that would be a gene that has been selected and or was selected in the ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. Studies like this allow us to identify potentially the genes that kind of make us uniquely human, right? 99% of our genome is exactly the same as a chimp, 
1% is different, is that 1% important or is that just random? Or the 1% that's different, if it's associated with dips like this in heterozygosity, that allows us to identify the parts of our genome that distinguish us from chimps and other close relatives. What about our genes makes us um, human? All right, so given all of this, and given that linkage disequilibrium is present in certain cases, it turns out that most alleles, when we're studying traits, are at linkage equilibrium, so that's having a D of about zero, unless they're very close or selection is happening or just happened. So we want to keep in mind that linkage disequilibrium can arise due to drift or due to selection, but when we look across the entire genome and look at all the thousands and thousands of loci and the alleles that they have, most of those alleles are at linkage equilibrium, which means we can treat them independently. It's only special cases that are linkage disequilibrium, and then we can't treat them mathematically as easy, but they provide us with often potentially more interesting information. This process by where one of the alleles was kind of carried to fixation by selection at the second allele, it's actually referred to as hitchhiking, right? That capital A allele hitchhiked along with the capital B allele, went along for the ride to fixation, even though it itself was not under selection. 